All right. Uh, can any, everybody hear me? Okay, awesome. So I'm just going to do a little bit of an informal poll here, just so that I'm not like completely off in terms of how I pitch these lectures. Uh, how many of you would classify yourselves as biologists, primarily? Slightly less than 50%. And among the non-biology people, how many of you are physicists? Okay, and how many of you physicists actually do wet lab experiments as well? Wet lab, meaning you're actually manipulating stuff <laughs> other than on the computer. Okay, okay, that's great. Uh, so I'm a wet lab evolutionary geneticist, um, and I think my lectures are going to be designed to give you briefly the sort of overarching uh, principles that guide the work in my lab. But uh, mostly I'm actually going to be telling you about how we can take very, very simple principles to get insights to perhaps excite, perhaps infuriate, depending on success rates, uh, your wet lab colleagues uh, in terms of like, you know, discoveries that could be translated, starting from uh, bi simple bioinformatics uh, to potentially uh, leading to more and more profound insights. So the way I've sort of uh, styled my lectures, and this is, I'm already anticipating this is going to be ambitious given uh, John's lecture, but the, the goal was to spend about two lectures working on host pathogen interactions as sort of a guiding principle. And then the third lecture on uh, genetic conflicts that are beyond this particular purview, right? So, and let's see how far we get. So it's super important. Uh, a couple of confessions. I actually, unlike John, I actually don't teach for a living. And I also speak really fast, especially if it's a, a topic that I'm really comfortable with. So both of these will require for you to rein in my enthusiasm a little bit, right? So it's not so important that I cover all the stuff that I've intended to cover. It's more important that the stuff that I do cover is at least uh, understandable by you guys, because it's really not about me telling you about my greatest hits. It's about you learning the kind of the principles here. So super important for you to shout out, because I may not look at you while I'm sort of describing. So just say question, and I'll stop, and then we can take the question. If I think that we are getting into a little bit of a loop or I'm going to address that, I might just ask you to just hold on to that question for a couple of slides. That's not me blowing you off. That just means that I'm going to cover that in a coming slide or two. And if you still have the question, raise it again. Okay? All right. So uh, I'm very interested in genetic conflicts as a concept. Uh, genetic conflicts uh, as a concept actually comes from a fairly unusual source in terms of its inspiration. We think about these as Red Queen interactions. For those of you who don't remember your English literature, the Red Queen was a fictional character introduced to us by Lewis Carroll in his series of books about Alice in Wonderland. And at one point in the book, the Red Queen says to Alice, uh, in response to Alice's complaint that we've been walking for a long time, we don't seem to be getting anywhere, the Red Queen says that actually in Wonderland, it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. If you want to actually get somewhere, you have to run doubly fast just so that you're actually making progress. This was actually a very important theorem, and we'll talk about why it was important in a sort of a Darwinian sense, uh, and synthesized as the Red Queen hypothesis by Lee Van Valen. And he pointed out that for organisms to be successful, it was just not important for them to adapt to their local ecology or their local environment, because part of that environment was also made up of other competing species, which were also adapting, which meant that there was this relentless race for exploitation of whatever the resource was existing. And that race was being run even if the environment, as we would observe it, is not changing, because the components of that environment, or at least the living components of the environment, were constantly changing. And if you stopped evolving, you ran the risk of being driven to extinction by virtue of the relentless nature of this competition, right? So we are going to make a very strong kind of distinction very early in my talk. Um, a, a distinction, for instance, between adaptation to explicitly an ecological niche. This could be uh, organisms moving to a new island or moving to a change in temperature where there is a segmental change in some driving component. And so uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with sort of the Fisherian model for adaptation uh, to a particular optimum environment. In this model, you start off somewhere in this two-dimensional space, but there is a clearly defined optimum for where you need to be in this new environment. 
And the size of the arrows really di dictates mutational events, right? So if you're over here, uh, if you make big arrows, you're just as likely to go towards the optimum as far away. However, bigger arrows towards the optimum are going to be selected for, and so you basically make big moves towards the optimum early in the adaptation. And as you get closer and closer to the optimum, you essentially are making fewer moves because now a big move is actually much more likely to take you away from this optimum space. But the point is, there is an optimum. It is actually static. It is being explored by mutations and adaptation relative to the competitors in the system. But the optimum itself is not moving once it's been established, right? Now, this is, of course, an oversimplification because you can imagine that there would be fluctuations, et cetera. But we are, of course, referring to a range of temperatures, et cetera, that are what are being adapted towards. This is quite distinct. I'll get just let, let me finish this thought. Uh, this is quite distinct from what happens, for instance, with uh, bacteria. For instance, bacteria could also be moving towards a new utilization of a new carbon source, right? And now the optimum is still there, but the optimum is changing because as the bacteria start pumping out metabolites into the uh, into the sort of uh, non-cellular components, they're actually changing the uh, chemistry of their local environment. And if that chemistry is moving them towards the optimum, this parameter completely holds. But if that chemistry is changing the optimum, this chemistry or this uh, adaptation doesn't work. So that's a different kind of adaptation, which we would refer to uh, not as molecular adaptation per se, but as genetic conflict. So what that means is, let's consider a virus population that's going to infect a host species, right? The host species adapts, so it gets better and better, more and more resistant to the viral population. Now, if this is left unchecked, the viral population is eventually going to go extinct because it's basically losing out on the food source that needs to be uh, uh, competent, which means that the viral population is going to adapt now to utilize whatever is present in the environment as its sort of ecological niche, which are the hosts. And this means now the optimum has shifted both for the virus and for the host. And it, it shifts sequentially in this two-step dance, basically, where the host is changing because it needs to escape, let's say, a pathogen. Then the pathogen is changing because it needs to reestablish its antagonism of the host. And essentially, this is these are these two steps indicated by these arrows. And what's distinct here is adaptation by the competitor. My voice probably carries in this room, but I'm going to... Keep it on. You have to record. Oh my God, that's to be very careful what I say. So please take everything I'm saying with a grain of salt for those of you listening. Okay, uh, each step the competitor takes changes this optimum, right? That's the key to remember. There is no universal equilibrium to be maintained. It's a steady state. It's always a steady state. Despite the fact that we sample very intensely, there is always a step in which one of these two entities is actually losing this arms race, which means that there's always going to be some sort of... Uh, uh, sort of pressure to adapt either on the pathogen or on the host side. Is that clear? Yeah. Yeah. Can you think of it as the finding the global maxima sort of? Well, like I mean, it's not really because you're actually finding there is a global maxima. What I'm simply pointing out is there is no such thing as a global maxima in the adaptation model. It's temporary. It's transient. And you're moving towards the global uh, maxima changes it, right? It's a frequency-dependent phenomenon. So the more hosts are immune, the greater the selective pressure on the pathogen to adapt away from that immunity. So the denser the population that's come closer to a particular optimum, the greater the probability that that optimum will shift far away from that optimum. And, and the optimum or the global maxima, as I like to think of it, is different for the for the pathogen and the host. That's right. That's the key here, because these are competitors. There is no universal optima that works well. This is not a system of symbiosis, right? This is not a system where the pathogen and the host can find some search space in that, uh, in that environment where both of them can kind of live in. They're essentially always in this back and forth mode uh, and at the fringes of this kind of arms race that's being played out. And that's basically the principle that drives this relentless engine for adaptation. Is that clear to everyone? Any questions about that? I'm slightly maybe digressing, but like this two-step dance, as you called it, have have people looked at 
trying to model it in a game theoretic way. Yes, yes. in fact, uh, this is uh, this is what I'm describing to you is a biologist's poor description of things that actually drive a lot of economic theory as well, going back to uh, folks like John Nash and stuff, right? Like finding what is the best given that you can anticipate strategies, etc. But today I'm actually trying to tell you how these kinds of signatures can be very useful in terms of finding the very sort of hot spots of adaptation and sort of give us some biological insight on how these might occur. Okay, so for the first two lectures, I'm going to focus on what I refer to as the usual suspects, case studies in which I don't have to uh, interpret or imagine a genetic conflict occurring. It's self-obvious by the nature of the biology of these. So these are, for instance, pathogens and hosts. In the last lecture, assuming I get to the last lecture, uh, I'll talk about case studies in which we don't anticipate genetic conflicts, but they're actually revealed to us by signatures that are very similar to what we see in these kinds of interactions, right? So here we are actually not like trying to discover new conflicts. We are simply trying to describe them in terms of their evolutionary signatures. And in the second category, we are trying to use those same signatures to understand new biology of conflicts in cellular processes that we do not previously estimate would be subject to these kinds of interactions. Okay, so very simple metric. We have more sophisticated versions, but for the perspective of this talk, very simple metric we use is to quantify innovation as it occurs in protein coding genes, right? So we've already uh, heard about the sort of uh, genetic code, the triplet code in which we've got three nucleotides that will encode for a particular amino acid, which ends up in the mature protein being encoded by a protein coding gene. So we're going to make uh, some assumptions here, and I'll try to justify them as we go along. All mutations can be classified into two types, those that do not alter the amino acid being encoded. So for instance, this codon changed from a CAA to a CAG, but the ultimate amino acid being encoded by them is still a Q or a glutamate, right? So this is effectively silent as far as natural selection is concerned, because this mutation has not actually led to a change in the protein coding gene. Um, in contrast, here's a different sort of codon, where again, you've got a mutation from an ATG to an ATC, but this changes this from a methionine to an isoleucine. We refer to these as non-synonymous or replacement changes. These are, of course, interpreted very differently by natural selection because they've immediately altered uh, the code of the protein that is being encoded here. Now, very important that we appreciate that since mutation is essentially a chemical process, it cannot actually distinguish. It's agnostic to whether the mutation that has been introduced is a silent or a non-silent mutation, right? It's actually natural selection that will discriminate between the outcomes of these mutations. But mutation is actually introducing these at roughly equal frequency. Because of the nature of the genetic code, there are roughly two times more non-synonymous replacements possible compared to a silent mutations. Just, that's just the degeneracy of the code. And so we have to normalize the number of synonymous changes to the possible number given the genetic code. And the non-synonymous changes are normalized to the possible number of non-synonymous changes. And that, that gives us a metric that we refer to as DS here, or DN uh, in this case, right? And that's the metric that we use to come up with our DNDS analysis. Any, any questions about that? This is super important that you guys get this because everything I'm talking about depends on this sort of intuition. Right, DS is normalized silent rate and DN is normalized non-synonymous rate. Shout it out, I'll repeat the question. As a kind of general question, is it known why there are like three uh, bases coding for one amino acid? Oh, why is the, why is the triplet code? Uh, it's an excellent question. I have no idea, except this is the minimum number you need, right? Uh, you, we do have 20 amino acids. There have been 20 amino acids for a very long time. And so if you think about it, uh, two would be too few, four would be too many, much higher. And so. That's the sort of goes back to like old days with Nuremberg's experiments, right? That perhaps three is just the best optimum. I will point out that the genetic code is largely universally conserved, but it's not always conserved. There are some uh, changes. I'll also point out the question I'll anticipate is, of course, it's completely possible to convert some of these codons to stop codons, right? Which will basically introduce a premature stop codon in the protein coding gene. I'm not considering them 
because I assume that those would be so deleterious that natural selection will have wiped those out almost as instantly as they appear because they are inherently loss of function type mutations. Now that's an assumption because if they occur late in the protein coding gene, perhaps they would be functional, but we're not actually considering those at the moment. The second assumption is that these silent changes are indeed silent to, not, uh, to natural selection. That is actually also false because these mutations can nonetheless still affect things like RNA stability and protein translation rates. But this assumption still works as a first order approximation because the selective coefficients of this class of mutations is far less than the selective coefficients associated with these non-synonymous mutations. Okay, everybody on the same page here? Okay. So let's imagine what is happening here. So this is also called KS or KA. These are the, the, the sort of normalized rates that we are considering when we make these calculations. These calculations are actually roughly very, very easy to make because they are effectively about, uh, you can use the complicated uh, software of Microsoft Word to calculate them if you're good with your math, or there are actually really good programs that can do this. So let's consider two types of scenarios, right? The first type of scenario is where it's really important that the protein coding sequence be conserved because that is in fact the ultimate output. This is a very important gene. That is the gene's function to encode this particular protein. And the sequence of that particular protein, let's say this is an enzyme, has to be really perfect. Otherwise, it won't function as an enzyme and it might as well be dead. So here are different versions of the same genes, let's say from different uh, organisms in the species. They all encode Steve as the final output, and very rarely they will encode Siv. But you'll realize that this is actually, this non-synonymous mutation is pretty rare in the population and probably reflects its rate of introduction by mutation and will be purged out of the population because it's presumably deleterious. As a result, what we actually have is a signature where even though mutation has introduced both of these at the same frequency, the actual uh, calculated rate of uh, synonymous changes is in excess of what it, we see for replacement changes. Very important, this is a signature of natural selection, not about mutation. Natural selection has actually purged the large number of replacement changes that ought to have occurred in this time frame because they were deleterious to function. And what we're looking at is actually this depletion of replacement changes, which is reflective of the fact that they were actually deleterious. Hence the term, purifying selection. Selection has acted to purge the population of these presumed deleterious non-synonymous mutations. Okay? Yeah. Way to estimate the rate at which selection will purge those? You can actually estimate that quite nicely. The deviant, the, the null model here is quite nice because it reflects KS should be equal to KA. And the degree to which you deviate from that is, a, is basically a really nice measure of how strong or how constrained that particular protein is. It's also important to emphasize different parts of the protein have different constraints, right? Like there could be something at the catalytic center of an enzyme that's absolutely conserved, cannot mutate at all, but things at the edge perhaps could mutate. And you can also calculate this degree of constraint by virtue of uh, deviations from K KS ratios, right? Question, yes. Absolutely, so this is what I was telling you before. Uh, synonymous mutations can be deleterious because they affect things like RNA folding or perhaps uh, rare codons, which you know, leads to things like codon bias, et cetera. I'm actually sweeping all of that stuff under the rug because actually these uh, have been estimated by selective coefficients, particularly in single cell organisms like bacteria and yeast. They do have selective coefficients that are deleterious, but on average, compared to an average replacement change, they're pretty you know, benign. And so it works as a first order approximation. When you look closer, of course, you have to pay more attention to the types of signatures you see. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not clear what the actual number of synonymous change would mean and divided. Actual number is, let's say, in this example would be one, two, three, four. But assuming that each of these codons can mutate to all possible uh, synonymous changes, that's the denominator, right? So the actual number is the ob an observed number. And the possible number is I can take this piece of sequence and mutate all of the residues. And what would be the number of synonymous changes that would actually occur if I allowed each of these uh, uh, variant positions to mutate to all other positions. So for instance, TCT could mutate to TCA, TCG, right? Which means there are three possible synonymous mutations to that codon uh, and one 
observed mutation. So the ratio becomes 1 to 3, for instance. So these ratios would change as you change the length of the cell? Completely. They, they depend on the codon. They also depend on the ratios, which is why you have to be better slightly than Microsoft Word to be able to calculate these, because they're very context-specific. You calculate these for a, for a gene. It doesn't matter what the, uh, this could be a comparison between two different species, or it could be a comparison within components of the same species, depending on the test. Observed changes, right? It has to be at least a pairwise comparison. So let's say if you only had these two sequences, you'd calculate two observed synonymous changes. But then you would be able to also just estimate from the sequence of this guy, the actual possible number of synonymous changes that could occur. And that gives you the numerator and the denominator. Is that me? Or my phone? Yeah. But it switched off though. Okay. Well, if it solves the problem, let's proceed. So this is, by the way, the basis for molecular biology, right? If you're going to make a mutation, you don't want to pick the like rapidly evolving like unconstrained position. You want to, if you want a mutation, you'll hit these highly constrained positions because you're much more likely to elicit a phenotype, right? So this becomes very important when we are doing things like that. If you look at this in a protein alignment, these residues that are completely conserved would stand out because they're completely frozen at the amino acid level, even though they're mutating at synonymous sites, right? So I'm actually interested in the opposite category which is what we refer to as diversifying selection, where if you do the same kind of calculation, what you find, surprisingly, is not only is the protein sequence not uh, conserved, it's actually evolving much faster than what you'd expect based on the synonymous sites, right? So here's a case where selection is not acted to constrain amino acid evolution, it's actually acted to accelerate the rate of fixation of these, presumably because when these variants occurred in the context that they occurred, they conferred a selective advantage. So this is again a proxy. Again, you can deviate from a KA-KS ratio of one, but the greater number of KA you see here is an indication of how selection has actually accelerated the rate of fixation of these kinds of things, right? Uh, and so it's super important for you to be able to kind of weigh both of these uh, kinds of things in order to be able to assess this. Really important, just let me finish this thought, proteins are not homogeneous entities. You can actually have a protein in which part of the protein is under purifying selection, and perhaps part of the protein that might be interacting with, say, a pathogen is under positive selection. So this kind of analysis, you can do this by averaging over the entire protein, but it could be much more useful if you actually have enough information to be calculating the KAKS ratios from individual amino acids across some swath of evolution. Go ahead. Just a clarification. So this is the same as directional selection? This is not the same as directional selection, unfortunately. So that's the confusion. Directional selection is something like this where, again, you do have adaptation. You cannot distinguish from K, K, S, but you're conver converging to a, this. Diversifying selection means that that optimum has changed so rapidly that you're not actually converging towards anything. There's a lineage-specific adaptation, but it's different in different lineages. So when you average them, you basically get kind of a gamish of many different selective pressures. Um, maybe I'm jumping a bit ahead. Uh, is there some analogous machinery for the non-coding uh, genome. I'm not going to talk about that at all. And one of the problems with looking at, say, long non-coding RNA um, is the fact that we don't actually have a good null model. Uh, and the reason we don't have a good null model is that there is no such thing that we can a priori assume is something that's neutral. I mean, KS here is our proxy for what would be a neutral evolution, and it's already kind of a poor proxy in long non-coding RNA. Unless you have really detailed information about base pairing and co-variation, you actually don't have a really good null model. So people do very sort of uh, gross, somewhat inappropriate things, like they calculate rates of mutation compared to, say, introns and, and phi prime UTRs compared. And, you know, all of those are, you know, measures that you can use, but all of those have, like, huge caveats associated with them. For instance, we assume in that instance that introns are completely neutral, but they're not. Um, and so it, it becomes really important to have a really good null model and null models, which are easy to like obtain in protein coding genes, relatively speaking, are not so easy in the non coding part of the genome. That's an excellent question. Yes. We're not considering them here, but there's actually, we, we may get a chance to talk about 
we can actually explicitly consider those. Particularly, we can actually look specifically at the insertions and ask whether those are deviant from the sort of progenitor piece of the uh, protein or have they adopted a new protein structure or sequence. So there are ways to look at insertions. But if, since this is assuming that we are calculating mutations by comparing sequences, we don't have a a priori way to assume that in this context, but there are other ways to look at that, which are small changes to this kind of approach. could be under purifying selection and part under diversifying selection. In that case, are the case values the same for the both, both the yeah, parts? Excellent question. Yes, they are. And they ought to be. Otherwise, you have a KKS ratio that's inflated because the KS is depleted for whatever reason. It could be because it's a methylated DNA. So we, those are the types of things that I'm going to talk about in a couple of slides. Okay. So just to sort of summarize, we also call this, uh, instead of KS, uh, this is now changed to actually a distance. So it's DN instead of KA and DS instead of KS. These are essentially equivalent because we'll also always consider them in terms of ratios. So the time aspect cancels out. When DN, DS is less than one, that's a signature of purifying selection or high evolutionary conservation. When DN, DS is greater than one, that's an indication of positive or diversifying selection uh, or constant innovation. Yeah, that's basically what this entire lecture is about. So if you just hold on to that question for two slides, I think I'll be able to answer that. Yeah. So why would we see this? Like, why would you see positive selection or constant innovation? So before I get to that, the, the important thing to emphasize is this is a very simple metric, right? You can calculate it at basically any evolutionary distance, but you really ought to be calculating it at a distance where the DS estimates are reliable, which means if they're too far away, like, for instance, like E. coli to salmonella, is, you know, that's a short distance, but the DS is basically saturated, which means your ability to actually estimate true DS versus what you observe is really kind of, you know, it's all bets are off. And that happens when DS begins to approach one, which means of all the possible synonymous changes that could occur in this protein coding gene, chances are like almost 100% of them have been hit, which means some of them have actually gone through two changes. And you cannot observe them because they are completely uh, hidden from your data set. So as you begin to approach DS equals one, your estimates of DN DS will become inflated. So that happens because DS will saturate at a lower evolutionary divergence than DN will, right? So if you're in this spot where DS is saturated but not DN, it will look like DN DS is greater than one. But that's because you've not been able to calculate the true DS. You're actually calculating what is mathematically limited to like a DS of one. There's no way for you to infer that. You can come up with some uh, Juke scanter or some other model to estimate what the true DS would be. But those are all models. Those are not actually coming from the data. So what's better is for you to stay within a range of evolutionary divergence where the DS is not saturated. And in our case, that works really well because we are very interested in mammalian or primate evolution where the DS is very well manageable. So the DS between humans and new world monkeys that we are very interested in is like 0 0.08, right? So it's very, very far away from a DS of one. Between human and mice is like 1.2. So you have to be careful, like people publish these things, but some of those are clearly false positives just based on what I said. Is that clear? That's right. So, so let, let's think about a practical example. Let's talk about this TCT guy that we talked about. We can go uh, to a large DS and say, oh, we have a T TCA, but it's at a DS where DS is close to one, which means the possibility exists that this went to G and then to A, and you're underestimating this because this is the one that you infer, but you've actually missed this kind of thing, right? And so the greater the divergence, the more of these unsampled events you're actually underestimating. And these events are far more frequent in DS than they are in DN, which is why DN can be accurately measured for greater evolutionary divergences than DS can be. All right? Okay. So this is a simple a metric which we calculated uh, by Adam Siepel's lab uh, of all protein coding genes in the human genome compared to chimpanzees and rhesus macaques. This works well because 
It's basically, you know, just comparing uh, uh, strings of nucleotides that make up these uh, protein coding genes, but gives us uh, enormous insight into the role of natural selection. So for instance, remember what we expect for a pseudogene that's no longer actually under some sort of protein coding potential is actually DNDS equals one. And there are far few genes in there. Most of the genes have a DNDS much less than one, which means most of the amino acid uh, altering mutations that have occurred in uh, selection uh, during evolution, at least between rhesus and human, were actually presumed deleterious and were purged out from the population. So what if none of, none of these had been purged out, all of them should be in this DNDS equals one, if that was simply reflective of mutation. The fact that they have this strong leftward bias means that on average, an amino acid mutation in an average protein coding gene is much more likely to be deleterious uh, than beneficial. Is that clear? That sort of makes sense, right? Otherwise, bioinformatics would not work. You've got, you know, and it also makes sense because perhaps there's a small range of changes in a particular position where you could accommodate biochemically similar amino acids, but mutation, of course, doesn't know that, so it can introduce all possible amino acids, and those biochemical alterations would be highly deleterious, right? So there's some constraint. That constraint doesn't have to be, it has to be this amino acid, but it at least has to be something biochemically similar at that position. Is that clear to everyone? Yeah, so for instance, what does constraint mean? So constraint simply means in the string of letters, let's say you have this uh, amino acid called alanine, right? Now it doesn't have to be conserved completely as an alanine. It could be an alanine or a serine or a cysteine. These are biochemically similar, but there's still only three of the possible 20 amino acids that could be encoded here, which means even if you tolerate three, you're not tolerating 17, and that's the constraint that's actually reflected there. Because mutation, of course, can introduce all possible uh, changes there, right? So the degree of constraint uh, will reflect like how strictly is alanine conserved compared to these other biochemically sim similar guys. But nonetheless, it is still constrained compared to the possible number of amino acids at that position. Yes? Okay. Hello? Yeah. Yeah, so you talked about... Uh... Uh, so this is uh, the T2A and the TGNA. This is basically like distance and displacement analogy. Yep. So actually the final distance, uh, displacement should be enough for you. So why do you need to actually understand the DS changes? Well, because, uh, so the total number for this codon, right? The total possible number of synonymous changes is the maximum of three. But for non-synonymous changes, there are actually a lot more, like each amino, each nucleotide substitution here gives you a different codon. Each, uh, I mean, uh, I'm asking why is, do you need to quantify that? The final displacement should be enough. Why do you need? No, to you need to quantify that because you're actually measuring the number of mutations that have occurred. You, that's what you're measuring. You're not actually measuring the uh, observed distance. You're actually interested in measuring the real distance. And in this case, when you estimate that the real mutation event is T2A, you're actually underestimating the actual uh, evolutionary distance between these two sequences. And that leads to greatly inflated DNDS ratios. You're essentially underestimating DS and therefore inflating DN. What's the inference will I get if I get to know the original distance versus the displacement? Then you'd be having a corrected DS, which would allow you to estimate true DNDS values, right? Just the evolutionary map, a better evolutionary map of the distance. You would be able to get, well, it's essentially like saying, I, 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 I drove to NCBS, I came back, I drove again. Did I go to NCBS for like 20 miles or did I actually drive 60 miles? For me, it's really important to know I drove 60 miles, but I can only estimate given the distance traveled that it's 20 miles. That's the analogy, right? So I'm really interested in the total time that has happened, right, since there, and I'm underestimating that based on these two metrics. And the DNDS ratio works on the assumption that you're looking at the same evolutionary divergence. Yeah? Okay. So, but even in this sort of very crude estimate, remember we are averaging it out the entire protein, we can see that there's a class of genes that still show a signature of DNDS greater than one. It's a small subset, uh, but still even in this whole gene average. And there are categories of genes that are of particular interest here. Immunity or in specifically innate immunity genes are very important and they're overrepresented in this category. This makes sense because they're part locked in arms race with a changing repertoire of pathogens, right? So you've basically got this arms race where it makes sense that innate immunity genes, 
would be, in fact, adapting to a changing landscapes of uh, pathogens that have been encountered, changing pathogens at this sort of evolutionary distance. But the important thing is also to realize there are other categories of genes that actually have no business belonging in this rapidly evolving category. Immunity is rapidly evolving. That's not like, you know, stop the presses. But there are genes involved in cell cycle control, in apoptosis, things which we think are actually fundamentally essential to the workings of a cell, and yet they are also rapidly evolving. And hopefully, if I get to that, we think that there might be both an immune as well as a non-immune explanation for those categories of genes. Uh, now, since many of you are sort of very uh, mathematically minded, it's important to emphasize this is a gross underestimate of positive selection. Just let me finish this thought. It's an underestimate because we've averaged over the entire protein. If I don't do that, actually we have enough information now that we can slide a window one amino acid code on at a time, right? If I do that, we estimate that 8 to 10% of all the amino acid differences between rhesus and human are actually driven by positive selection. And this covers hundreds of genes, uh, at last count at least 600 genes, which means the signature of adaptation, this molecular signal that we are trying to infer, is distributed over multiple uh, proteins. It's highly concentrated in certain categories of proteins, but that doesn't mean that it's actually completely devoid in other categories of proteins. It's just that in, it's just in a smaller subset as a percentage of those amino acids. Yes. Well, we have a null model where of DNDS equals to one, right? What that means is these are now bona fide protein coding genes in the genome, right? So they've already been a priori assigned as protein coding. And most protein coding genes are not involving neutrally. They're evolving under constraint. This is simply reflecting that there is constraint acting upon those, right? If I were to take a pseudo gene and do the same thing, it would basically show DNDS equal one because there's no actual amino, uh, amino acid constraint acting on that piece of DNA anymore. Yeah. Yes. I'm, I'm reflecting rapid evolution, uh, which simply refers to DNDS exceeding one. It almost is independent of the time scale because that is essentially normalized uh, in this time axis. As long as DS is not saturated, I'm interested in all of those divergences. So basically a change in every generation. A change in every generation, a change over millennia, all of those things are, are okay. Obviously you'd uh, consider, I can do the same thing with chimpanzee and human, right? But those would actually be much messier as a, of a histogram because those two species are so closely related that stochastic events will basically overwhelm signatures, right? So I need to have some distance where it's not simply a stochastic event that would lead to a category falling into the positive versus the purifying selection. Enough distance has passed between rhesus and human that there's been an actual accurate signal of natural selection that has occurred. That doesn't mean we cannot infer natural selection between chimp human, it's just those estimates are subject to more type one error, yeah? If too much time has passed, you have saturation error, so you've got both types of error. So there's a sweet spot to making these inferences. So what does this mean in a biochemical sense? Let's talk about like what would be the type of thing that would actually drive the signal. So let's consider two proteins whose interaction is really important, let's say for some cell signaling cascade, some of the proteins that John was talking about earlier. Now, because the interaction between these two proteins is really important, not only are the proteins going to be conserved, but any mutation that perturbs their interaction, which will be occurring, right, by random mutation, would be considered deleterious and would be purged from the population because there's a very, very low probability that if a mutation occurs in this protein, there'd be a compensatory mutation floating around in the population exactly at that time to essentially reestablish that binding to this mutant version, right? So because these are occurring in a sea of wild-type alleles, they would be considered individually deleterious and removed far before they've had a chance to encounter a, a suppressor mutation, if you will. So which means you can come back millions of years later and what you'd find is actually the surface exposed residues that participate in this interaction are completely conserved. I know a lot of you are taking pictures, but this is actually all covered in the reading material and I'm happy to give you things. I, I don't mind you taking pictures, but I don't want you to lose the train of thought, right? There's also a video recording apparently. So. 
Yeah, so you can even like hear, I don't know, that's an advantage, but you can at least read what's been written at your leisure. Um, and including some of the very figures that are explained as well. So it's important to consider just very briefly as, as a digression, you know, in genetics, we use this principle very robustly. Let's say we are very interested in the proteins that interact with this hexagon protein. We can introduce a mutation that makes this particular protein non-functional to the point where the organism may no longer survive. And we can simply select on that organism to come up with a solution. And the solution it may come up with is a version of this purple protein that perfectly interacts with the mutant form of that protein. This is what we refer to as a suppressor screen. You're finding interacting partners of this protein by introducing a mutation in partner one and looking for a compensating mutation in an interacting partner. Now, this is not how normal natural selection works. Right? We are putting specific selection, especially to encounter uh, versions of this protein that can interact with this mutant form. In natural selection, this allele would occur. It would be deemed deleterious by natural selection and immediately purged by fitness measures. And so there would not be enough time for it to persist in the population for it to basically uh, encounter a suppressor, which means these interaction interfaces are actually being maintained by purifying selection. This is also the same situation between a host and a symbiont, right? You basically want to maintain that interaction. Um, I'll walk around a bit. Okay. So uh, is that clear? So why we would see purifying selection? It could be for intrinsic function, but it could also be because of interactions with other partner proteins, either from within the same genome or from symbiotic interactions between genomes. Let's consider the alternative, which is an arms race between a host and a virus. Once again, this is a protein-protein interaction, but the key difference is it is in the best interest of the host to maintain this interaction and in the best interest of the pathogen to evade this interaction, right? Here it's in the best interest of both genes to maintain the interaction. Here the interests are different, hence the term genetic conflicts. They're in conflict with each other. So what will happen is viruses will evolve to evade this binding affinity event, whereas hosts will evolve to reestablish this binding affinity event. So here again, we've got a protein interaction interface between these two components, just like here. But this one is being maintained against mutation, and this one is being constantly perturbed and reestablished because of this relentless two-step dance between host and pathogen. Is that clear to everyone? Okay, this is the most profound thing I would like to take away from the three lectures, so if you get this concept, it's awesome. Um, because this is essentially saying that you've got these divergent selective pressures that are shaping protein interaction interfaces, but they're arising because you've got different genetic interests from one party and the other. Yes? Okay. So let's take this, uh, yeah. It's a genetic suppressor screen. It's sort of not relevant. It was just a digression. It's suppressor. Yes. You're yeah, looking for a genetic, a second genetic mutation that can suppress the first. That's the uh, etymology of the term. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay, this is just clarifying, but this might be just at the codon level. Well, both of these are happening at the codon level. Uh, both of these are happening at the genome level. That's, after all, the unit of inheritance here. Uh, both of them are actually affecting codons. We can get into that in a, a very specific thing. Actually, let's get into that now. Let's assume you take this at face value. Now we don't expect these uh, alterations of binding affinity to occur randomly, right, over the protein. We expect those changes to be concentrated on those residues that maximally affect the binding affinity. In the virus side, to escape binding, in the host side, to reestablish binding, right? So even if we take this very simple metric of positive selection or DNDS greater than one, we expect that signature to be maximally concentrated on those residues that are affecting what is the unit of, you know, selection here, which is binding affinity, right? Clear to everybody? Everybody buys that? Okay, well, it's a hypothesis. It's important to emphasize that, right? That's our hypothesis to ask, can we use the signature of uh, sort of positive selection determined binding affinity to estimate what the interaction residues between these hosts and viruses are, even though we don't actually know anything about the biochemistry of the residues, right? Uh, 
So this is in a second review, which I'll actually send you this afternoon. I'm just going to go through how we do this, right? And we're going to revisit this over and over with the principles. So it all starts off with an analysis or a multiple alignment of sequences. And the depth of that sequencing is limited by how much you are willing to sequence, but also how much is within this, uh, you know, prevents the saturation of DS, right? So ideally, you'd like to sequence as many species as possible, but you don't want to introduce too many species that are too divergent to be able to pro properly estimate the NDS ratios. If you have enough sequences, you can actually slide a column one codon at a time and estimate all of the positively selected residues in two ways, actually, right? You can either say, well, in this uh, protein alignment, whole protein alignment, what are the episodes of positive selection that have occurred in evolution, right? You're averaging over all the DNDSs, let's say leading up to chimp or leading up to orangutan compared to human. And those you can say, wow, a whole gene average DNDS exceeds one. So we have now these episodic signatures of positive selection that have acted on this particular protein in this particular window of evolution. Or you can slide a window one amino acid at a time and say, these are the amino acids that show recurrent signatures, averaging all, all of this divergence. These are the residues that have showed multiple hits, where this residue has changed multiple times in evolution. It's really important to emphasize DNDS ratios require multiple hits. The same thing has to be hit multiple times. So it's actually a little bit of a conservative measure, because if this happened once, that could have been adaptation, but I might not infer that as adaptation because DS is high enough and it subsumes the DN signature. So these two are different ways at looking at positive selection. This one looks at it with a time axis in mind, and this one looks at it with a protein structure axis in mind, right? Looking at the individual residues that have recurrently been faced this sort of insult of uh, adaptation. Is that clear? Right, so two pieces of information, both of them can uh, converge or not converge depending on your interest. So now, in addition to this, we have potentially from the laboratory or your uh, friendly colleagues down the hall, potentially information about what is the phenotype uh, of this particular protein. If it's an antiviral gene, like I'll describe in a second, the phenotype could be this particular gene is either susceptible or not susceptible to, to say, a viral antagonism. Either the virus or the host is winning, and we expect that to be a binary state. In one of these situations, the virus is winning. In one of these situations, the host is winning. If we have this information, we can combine it with this information and basically pinpoint which are the residues that are maximally going to uh, explain the signature of these phenotypic differences. Do you understand? So remember, this reflects different species here, right? This is a tree of different species. This could be chimp, human, uh, gorilla. Uh, and what this is saying is that for a particular virus, let's say HIV, this particular protein is winning against chimp and human, but losing against gorilla. So that's the information that we have from a test tube. And that's the information that we are actually using. We, so we combine this particular information with this particular information to come up with candidate loci. This is a scrunched up perspective from here individual protein residues that might actually, by individual mutations, alter the change to take the virus from a winning position to a losing position by virtue of single amino acid differences. That's assuming everything worked. All your assumptions work, you have enough information, and the density of the information is appropriate. And what we'll describe in the next uh, two lectures, in these uh, two lectures, is case studies where it works really well, even in situations where we actually have very little biochemical information. Yes. Residues as individual amino acids. Residues is just a synonym for amino acids. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. The, the phenotype here could be binding affinity or a viral infection uh, in that particular experiment. That's the linear, that's exactly the assumption. That the uh, genetic diversity that we see and infer from signatures of positive selection uh, directly relates to the phenotype that we're looking at. And there's absolutely nothing that uh, fully uh, supports that assumption unless you do the experiment. So that's the sort of weakest link in this kind of uh, intellectual thread, yeah? So for instance, if this uh, positive selection was actually driven by virus one, right? and you test it against virus two, 
there'd be like no connection, right? So the assumption is that at least some part of the selective uh, adaptation that has occurred against virus one is still relevant, even though you're actually looking at a slightly unrelated virus. That means that the modes of adaptation in any given protein are more constrained than all of the residues of the protein. So by identifying signatures of adaptive evolution uh, in protein against some hypothetical virus, it would still be relevant against the virus that you're actually testing in the laboratory right now. Why do we say that, right? Implicitly, remember, this is a time axis, right? And we are averaging over multiple species, which means we are averaging over the history of those species. If this is primates, that's 40 million years of evolution. We don't know of any virus that has infected these primates for 40 million years, right? So this is averaging over multiple individual episodes, potentially of different viruses. And we are making the assumption that those would still be relevant in defining for us what are the residues that can actually dictate viral specificity. Yeah, that's the assumption. Yes. Just shout it out because we're getting a lot of feedback. Um, yeah, so, so what happens when, um, like, in the drawings that you had of the virus proteins, right, there's basically one type of viral shape which has sort of like swept through the entire viral population. So what happens when you have two types of viral proteins? It doesn't matter because it's all about adaptation. It's just driving signatures of change in the host protein. You could have two variants or three variants. Essentially, you could have a frequency-dependent selection regime, and it doesn't matter because all of those are all of those population genetic uh, arguments. Remember, we are averaging over like 40 million years of those population genetic arguments, so they're all kind of wiped out. We also look at just one variant from each individual primate species. That's of course not accurate either because you could have variation within humans or within chimpanzees, but it still works because we are basically capturing that variation uh, just by like averaging over all of that evolution. And uh, well, one more thing is what happens if one of the host proteins or viral proteins like duplicates? We'll talk about that in about two minutes. Yeah. So it is of course very important and that would basically maybe dilute the signal of positive selection or it might enhance it. That sort of depends on whether both parties are now still interested in the business of uh, competing against viruses or one of them has taken on a completely different function. So when we, whenever we see a gene duplication, we have to be very cognizant of that. So these are assuming all of them are true orthologs, which means there's one to one species kind of uh, analogy. But they don't have to be. This would work equally well if these were all gene duplicates in one genome. So for instance, olfactory receptors in the human genome. I could have no information from chimp. I could simply line up gene one, gene two, gene three, gene four from humans and do the same inference. As long as DS is not saturated, I'd be totally uh, justified in doing that, yeah? So the evolutionary distance is really your, art, you know, your interest. What are you interested in? Are you interested in all primates? Are you interested just in the human genome? Mm -hmm. At this point of time, and you are getting the sequences from different species which you are comparing. Yeah. And uh, let us say you find evidence of positive selection in these particular species, and that's the uh, speed line. Yeah. Uh, uh, so now uh, you know that uh, for some reason, for whatever reason, um, you know, the, the, that is a point where the innovation has been taking place uh, so consistently for, for 40 million years. Yeah. Okay. Still, you are looking not at the, you're looking at a single virus. That's right. There you don't have a different virus. Yeah, this is the question that Eric was asking. How do we know that this uh, selective signature, which is average over 40 million years of evolution, is even relevant to a virus that's far too young to have caused that signal in the first place? And so there we are making the assumption that if you're a host protein, you tend to be antagonized or you tend to be recognizing viruses using very similar binding interaction interfaces, right? So what's relevant to a sea of unknown viruses is also relevant to a virus that is of interest today. And that's the assumption. That's why you have to do the experiment. So all we know is that this is in fact likely to be a hotspot that is reflective of some binding affinity to some virus. What you don't know is it is, is it a binding affinity to the virus that you're particularly interested in. That's where you have to kind of do the experiment. So if you assume that it is this particular virus, then you can talk about virus winning or host winning. That's right. But this signal of virus winning or host winning 
is something you can easily extract. And I'm going to give case studies in a, a couple of slides. You can extract that by putting these, uh, the protein coding sequences from each of these genomes into a context where you can study them uh, with the virus with no problem, right? Like you can study them in isolation in a test tube or as I'll show you even in yeast, right? So something that occurred as a conflict within primates can be studied out of context because it's basically, uh, we think, a binding affinity event that we can measure even just by expressing individual proteins. So virus winning or host winning could be simply binding affinity yes or no, and that would be a very easy thing to calculate without the sort of, you know, underpinnings of a full cellular mechanism. So with this tree and this information, by looking at the signal, I'm trying to rank prioritize all of the positively selected residues that maximally fit. I have to make the least number of assumptions to look at these evolutionary transitions. And then I'm basically prioritizing among all the residues under positive selection, which are the ones that are the minimum set of assumptions I need to explain the differences back and forth, right? So what we have here is essentially on this tree, I have individual residues per position. And then I have the states of these, either the virus or the host is winning. And I'm trying to use these two matrices to come up with the minimum set of assumptions I need to explain all of the phenotypic differences. So positive selection allows me to reduce the complexity of the protein sequences to just a few residues that are under positive selection. And this allows me to come up with this phenotypic space of zero or one, depending on whether the virus is winning or losing. And by combining the two matrices, I can prioritize which of these pink residues are likely to explain all of the phenotype. It may be that one residue cannot explain it, and then I come up with a second residue and so on. This is the tree that I'm constructing from all of the sequences. And then I'm putting onto this tree the positively selected states and comparing them to the phenotypic states of the virus of the host winning. It'll be more clear once you see the example. And No, I'm telling you the history of when it was residue A versus residue C. It has nothing to, uh, this particular virus is far too young to have caused that. So the virus is just a phenotypic readout of the genetic history of that particular residue. Okay. So I'm going to actually talk about a more complex problem than what I've described to you. And this is actually a problem that comes from uh, antiviral proteins and viral proteins that are locked in this arms race. But you'll notice that the viral proteins have a lot more advantages, right? They can evolve more rapidly. They're also subject to larger effective population sizes. All of these things are in the advantage of the virus. But it's really important to emphasize that I'm looking with the window of one antiviral protein, but there are literally a hundred of these. And for any given virus, even a simple virus such as polio or HIV, it has to negotiate per cycle of cellular infection about 100 or greater protein-protein interactions with host proteins, right, for every cycle of infection. And what's amazing is the virus has to win each of those interactions, avoid some or bind some. For the host to win, it actually needs to win just one of those interactions, and that's where the math averages out. The polynomial nature of the immune defense against viruses, where we have dedicated proteins whose only job is to be turned on when you detect a pathogen attack, is the reason why we're all in the room, despite the fact that we've faced you know, millions of years of viral assault. And so the virus is basically just poised on the verge of being inhibited as long as one of the immune proteins just has the right particular mutation. That's what we're basically assessing. So it's a polynomial to sort of uh, one type of interaction, but we are basically looking at it with the lens of just one antiviral protein. Yeah? And there are many instances where the viral protein that is used to antagonize the antiviral protein is itself a stolen host protein, right? So many viruses will steal host proteins as decoys or mimics to try to basically block the host immune system. And we'll talk about that mostly in this lecture, probably a little bit in the next lecture, depending on the fact that I'm running out of time. Um, and so we are very interested as a class of problems in you, how to overcome pathogen mimicry. This is very, very common for some classes of viruses, and very, very common for bacteria. So bacteria are really great at stealing proteins and basically presenting the host as a challenge to be able to distinguish between what is now a bacterial protein and the original host protein that is part of the uh, signaling cascade. 
Yes? Okay. So this is all work that was done by Nels Lee, who's a former postdoc in the lab, and he's so former that he was just appointed associate professor yesterday. So he's been gone from the lab long enough. I thought this would be nicely illustrative. So for doing this, I'm going to describe what this antiviral protein is. It's called PKR for protein kinase R. And it works against a number of viruses, but I'm just going to describe its arms race with pox viruses here. So what happens with typical viral infections is an unusual signature of pathogen infection within the cell is the presence of double-stranded RNA, which is very unusual to find floating around freely in the cytoplasm of host cells unless they happen to be infected by a viral pathogen. It actually turns out it doesn't matter whether it's an RNA virus or a DNA virus. At some point in the life cycle, they produce uh, this epitope of double-stranded RNA. So PKR is actually expressed as an inactive monomer, but on sensing double-stranded RNA, it will dimerize and activate itself as a kinase. So it turns on as soon as it detects double-stranded RNA, and PKR has one substrate, basically. And the substrate is not a viral protein, it's a host protein called EIF2-alpha, or elongation initiation factor 2-alpha. And on binding and phosphorylating it, it basically blocks translation through the host ribosome. So the upshot is PKR is a cellular response to detect pathogenic viruses and block the host translation machinery very quickly with very rapid kinetics because it doesn't want the cell to be taken off as a viral production factory, right? If you block the host, uh, it's a great way to basically prevent the host from being taken over to produce a lot of daughter viruses. Now, this is a very effective strategy, except viruses have been faced with PKR as a challenge for a long time, and they've come up with very clever solutions. So some viruses encode proteins that will basically prevent the dimerization of PKR. They're rare. Some viruses encode proteins that will bind up or squelch up all the double standard RNA so they don't present it to PKR, very, very common. Some viruses have actually stolen a host EIF2-alpha phosphatase. So PKR keeps putting phosphates, and this viral protein keeps taking off the phosphates in this battle. But perhaps the most clever invention is viruses such as hepatitis C virus that allow PKR to block this production. Because not only does this block production uh, of, of viral proteins, presumably, but it also blocks production of all of the immune proteins that are trying to be uh, produced in response to the pathogen. And HCV has come up with an EIF2-alpha independent means of protein translation, which is amazing, right? It's called an iris sequence or internal ribosomal entry site, which means that this constant battle for host translation machinery has led to all of this innovation, even in fundamental translation of viruses, right? So you've got this uh, episode of uh, infection, host translation block, and then innovation on the part of the virus. But today I'm going to tell you about a specific uh, uh, escape, which is encoded by pox viruses that encode a protein called K3L. And K3L is far more interesting than this slide indicates. I'll get to that in a second. But for the purposes of this slide, it's a decoy protein that binds a PKR in a very tight manner, displaces the IF2 alpha so it can go on and do host translation, right? So it's now, again, a game of binding affinity. K3L binds PKR tighter than EIF2 alpha, and that allows EIF2 alpha to be released and works in the favor of the virus. Is that clear? Everybody gets the double negatives here? Okay. So like with many things, we start off with our analysis of simian primates. This turns out to be a very beautiful system to do DNDS type analysis because there's enough diversity, but there's not saturation of DS. So that's kind of like our... Uh, go-to model system. And so this is an example where we can actually infer DNDS rates by back-calculating ancestral states of amino acids with certain likelihoods and actually estimating DNDS not only as they occur in the like terminal branches, but also in deep branches. This reveals, for instance, this branch leading up to this lineage of old world monkeys where we estimate that 22 non-synonymous or protein-altering mutations occurred before even a single synonymous mutation occurred. That's highly, highly unlikely. Like the p-values are off the charts. That suggests a very, very intense episode, recurrent episodes of adaptation when multiple amino acids basically went boom, boom, boom in fixation, presumably because they were all faced uh, with pathogen challenges. But, you know, even more modest looking things like 2.8, that's a whole gene average. So that's a really intense signal of positive selection, because remember, the neutral expectation is a one. And there are other instances where actually it's much less than one, which suggests 
purifying selection on a whole gene level. These are DNDS calculations, that's right. And so if we do this now on a, a amino acid by amino acid level, you can see, sorry, I back uh, mutated my slides here. You can see there's a profound signal of positive selection that is distributed all over the PKR protein, right? So it's not like one signal, one particular site that's revealed. That's very distinct from a protein I'm going to tell you about tomorrow, where it's just one domain that's the hotspot. In this case, it looks like the entire protein has been facing this. That's really interesting because it actually turns out that there are, in fact, multiple viruses that block PKR. And what we are looking at is probably a gestalt of all of the antagonism that PKR has faced over the 40 million years of evolution, over multiple sites of its residues. And we basically cannot distinguish between one episode versus the other, right? So that makes it really difficult to say, well, okay, so what is it that K3L or E3L are binding? Because we really don't know what, what would be the positive selection of PKR that's really relevant to pox viruses compared to, for instance, herpes viruses. So for that, we needed an assay. And so before I do that, I want to tell you what K3L is. After all, this is a talk about mimicry. K3L happens to be an EIF to alpha mimic. So what better protein to bind PKR and displace EIF to alpha than EIF to alpha itself? You'll notice from this crystal structure that the part of the protein that interacts with PKR has been almost completely conserved, even at the protein sequence level but the part that interacts with the rest of the translation machinery has been completely jettisoned, right? That makes sense because K3L's job is to act as a decoy for PKR binding, but not to poison the translation machinery or the interactions that we have to all with the rest of the machinery, right? So amazingly, this invention of K3L as a mimic of EIF2 alpha has occurred three separate times for three separate lineages of double standard DNA viruses. It's occurred in pox viruses, including things that infect mammals, iridoviruses that include things that exclusively infect fish, infect amphibians, right? Three separate cases of convergent evolution where you've come up with the same strategy of mimicking the substrate of PKR to act as the decoy. So this is, of course, very interesting just in its own right, right? How do you, this is like a thing that goes back to Bates and Muller. How do you basically deal with this conundrum about mimicry in an ecological sense, right? How do you basically distinguish between what is a model versus a mimic? And you have to do that. What's the, what's the evolutionary pressure for innovation to occur here? We decided to study this because we thought that this might actually reveal some guiding principles because these are not frozen. They also are driven to adapt. And it's unclear what would be the driving pressure for that adaptation uh, given what we know learning uh, mimicry. Mimic and EIF2 alpha is the model uh, protein that is being mimicked. Okay, so what is the challenge for PKR? The challenge for PKR's kinase domain is to maintain the interaction with EIF2 alpha, but avoid the interaction with K3L, right? That's the whole game. It needs to be able to distinguish between these two entities, which is really hard because K3L's only job is to look like EIF2 alpha, right? So, so in, in a sense, this is kind of like the the problem, and you may come up with your intuitive solutions and you can sort of hold it for a second because we came up with a lot of intuition that all turned out to be wrong. So, so, so you, should, you should see your intuition is far better than ours. So supporting the fact that PKR is under positive selection, this is a sliding window between human and research, and this is the DNDS equals one line, and you can see basically every domain of PKR, including the kinase domain, is under very strong positive selection. So it pays the signal diversifying uh, selection over Sorry. I have lost the, uh, it's on my shirt. I've just lost the linkage. I got it. You guys have heard me though, right? I'm not going back separately. Okay, maybe I need somebody else to do it. This happens. Okay, actually it turns out that there are three other EIF2 alpha kinases in the human genome or in all uh, vertebrates, including another kinase involved in the unfolded protein response, which means if the cell faces a glut of badly folded proteins, it also wants to block host translation. And that is carried out by a, uh, the progenitor of PKR, which is a protein called PERC. Uh, and, and so this is actually expressed through the ER, 
But if you look at PERC, PERC is basically under purifying selection, right? So here we have two kinases. One's dedicated for immune function, very rapidly evolving. This one's a housekeeping function, very slowly evolving, exactly what you'd expect. In fact, PKR is the only kinase out of 80 in the human genome that show a signature of positive selection, right? Kinases tend to be very important for housekeeping functions and not very rapidly evolving. Okay, a very simple way to solve this is for PKR and EIF2 alpha to constantly co-evolve in concert with each other, right? And do that to the expense of excluding K3L. Awesome intuition, totally doesn't work. EIF2 alpha is so frozen in evolution that it's undergone zero amino acid changes over not only the 40 million years that we've assessed, but over 1 billion years of evolution, right? Uh, and I'll show you evidence for that. So e EIF2 alpha is basically like a frozen rock as far as we are concerned in terms of evolution. And yet this is rapidly evolving. So we wondered, okay, what's going on with K3L? Because if K3L's only job is to mimic something that's completely frozen in evolution, it should also be frozen in evolution. After all, it's already arrived at the optimal state. So to do that, we compared K3L between different pox viral genomes in this awesome resource site called poxvirus.org. And when we did that, just like the fact that PKR is very rapidly evolving, we found that K3L is the most rapidly evolving gene in pox viral genome. So it is not the case that it has had the luxury to mimic an unchanging protein like AIF2 alpha. It, in fact, is also part of an arms race with PKR, and we became very interested in trying to decipher this arms race between the two proteins. Yeah? Yes. Yeah, so I'm not actually going to tell you what it is using to discriminate, but it's not the trailing bit. Yes, but that's, that's your protein engineer coming to the rescue. But that's not necessarily the most elegant solution for natural selection. Okay, so to do this, like in response to Sanjay's question, we needed an assay. Now, we don't actually have all of these primate cell lines and infection models, et cetera, et cetera. But remember, I just told you, EIF2 alpha is basically frozen in evolution. So we can actually put human PKR or primate PKR into yeast cells, and it actually has the conserved property of binding yeast EIF2 alpha, phosphorylating it and causing a growth arrest in yeast. So we can convert what is basically a system of primate exclusive immunity to an assay that's very easy. So this is just the ingenuity that we have to use depending on what antiviral protein we're studying, because we want the ability to be able to assay a number of very divergent primate sequences in the same system. And in this system, yeast turned out to be a really powerful way to do that, right? And if we express K3L and it can displace this, presumably we can rescue the growth of these yeast strains. So this is exactly what we saw. So these are all PKR alleles from this panel of simian primates, including orangutan, human, gibbon, this is PKR being expressed under galactose control. So this is inducible, which means when we grow them on glucose plates, there's no PKR being expressed. All of these yeasts can grow up fine. But as soon as we turn on galactose, all of these cause a growth arrest, right? So PKR from all of these is completely functional to bind and phosphorylate EIF2 alpha. So that's the first part of the equation, right? They're all capable of binding and phosphorylating the substrates. The second part of the equation is, What's the output when you introduce K3L into the mix, like the third partner? And here, it's that binary response that we were hoping for. In some cases, the presence of K3L had no impact on whether PKR was able to maintain the growth arrest. In other cases, it completely reversed the growth arrest. And that's the case where the virus was winning because the growth arrest was completely overturned. In this case, the virus was still losing because the host protein was not impacted by this. So those are the two states that we've inferred in terms of this very simple interaction between this particular version of the K3L protein, which is from vaccinia virus, and this panel of PKR proteins uh, from different simian primates. Yes? Okay, but this is just controls to show that there's nothing funky going on in terms of expression levels. Now, what's also, yeah. These are, these are, the cells are growing, the yeast is growing. Here, the virus is winning because it has basically reversed the growth arrest. 
right? So it's a double negative because when PKR is effective, it's blocked translation and causes a growth arrest. That's what happens. If the virus is able to overcome the growth arrest, like happens here, the virus is winning because now presumably the viral genome can be translated properly by the host machinery. When the virus is winning, it eventually kills the cells by overproducing viruses, right? When PKR is winning, when the host is winning, it will eventually kill the cell, but without producing any additional virus. So the game is about whether you can take the resources of the host to produce more daughter viruses, or you will not produce any daughter viruses. In both cases, the, the host cell that's infected will die, but in this case, it will die without producing any viruses, basically impeding the viral life cycle. In this case, it will make a thousand viruses and then kill itself. Yeah, so this is this cartoon here. We're just using yeast as a proxy for this growth arrest because it works so well since yeast EIF2 alpha is identical in sequence to human EIF2 alpha. So we're using yeast as a test tube to see the efficacy of PKR's ability to block the ribosome. Yeah, so if the yeast cell grows, right? then PKR is not effective or has been blocked from being effective like in this cartoon, where you introduce K3L, it displaces EIF2 alpha. Now this EIF2 alpha is free to continue translation and rescue the growth arrest, which leads to a rescue of the growth arrest. Yeah. Well, in this case, there's no virus. They are just two proteins. Yeah. There are no viruses and there's no other human protein here. You've taken the the... Uh, PKR proteins from primates and the K3L protein from one pox virus, and we are just playing this game with just these two proteins. There's only K3L. That's right. Yeah. K3L is the representative of the virus in this case. Yeah. I should point out that we can actually mutate the EIF2 alpha phosphorylation site. Yeah, this is an important control, and that, of course, rescues the growth arrest because all of the PKR growth inhibition is happening because of this particular residue. Okay. So uh, I wanted to make another additional point here. You'll notice there's a big difference, for instance, between human and gibbon, right? So in human, you would say that human PKR is winning against K3L because regardless of K3L's production, PKR is basically able to cause the growth arrest. Gibbon PKR is losing because it's basically essentially reversed by the K3L production. In fact, this is exactly what we see with primate cell lines. So whenever you do an experiment in yeast, you have to worry about, is this even relevant to primate cell lines? So here are human, gibbon, and orangutan cells that have been infected with two types of viruses, vaccinia, wild-type virus, and a, a virus in which the K3L gene has been deleted. In human, you'll notice there's not a significant difference drop in fitness when you delete K3L, and that's because the vaccinia K3L is basically ineffective at killing the human PKR activity. Similarly with orangutan, no difference between these two statistically. But with gibbon, you can see deleting K3L has this profound impact on viral fitness, because in this case, the K3L gene of vaccinia is really good at inhibiting the PKR gene from gibbon. So deleting K3L makes a huge impact, but only in gibbon cells. No impact. So this is this binary state I was talking about. K3L is a really important pathogenicity determinant. But if you only did an experiment in human, you would conclude it's basically no, have no value at all. Except if you did Gibbon, you'd say, my God, it's really important. So it's very important to consider that these are bouncing between these two binary states. And it's important to consider this in the context of the host species that are available to these pox viruses in order to fully assess these viral uh, proteins as well. Yeah. As you said, K3L uh, is, is a mimicry, and it has been taken out from one of the host organisms. So it would be something like it went into the organism, and some part of the EIF2 was uh, directly copied onto the viral genome and came out. So if you compare the sequence of K3L with all the EIF2 you have, then you would find something, uh, the host organism from which it originated. Well, so the problem is EIF2 alpha at the protein level is identical between yeast and human. But the gene level, you could distinguish, right? Well, the protein sequence is the same. So K3L is not any more close to one type of EIF2 alpha than another, since they're all identical. Then how is it that uh, it's effective against some and not effective against the others? Ah, that's what I'm getting to here. I haven't told you that part of the story yet. So 
Okay. So, so that's a mystery. How is it that it's effective against some PKRs and not against? So we began to look at those signatures of adaptation, right, at the molecular level. And in particular, we focused our attention uh, because of this co-crystal structure between PKRs, kinase domain, and EIF2-alpha. You can see this is like EIF2-alpha is docking on this bird perch, which is composed of this alpha helix called the G helix in this PKR kinase domain. This is, by the way, a conserved feature of all kinases that interact with EIF2-alpha. In this case, the G helix is the one part of the protein you would estimate should be completely frozen because this is the part of PKR that interacts with the substrate that's completely frozen, right? This is the part you would estimate should be completely frozen because it's basically com conserved. In fact, when we look at this in more detail, these are the three residues that make direct contacts with uh, EIF2-alpha. These are the three most rapidly evolving residues in the kinase domain, right? So just think about that. That is not what you'd expect based on conserved interaction between PKR and EIF2-alpha. This is almost certainly the result of mimicry that has occurred over the course of evolution, where this particular important interaction interface between EIF2-alpha and PKR has been constantly influenced by diversifying selection. So the question becomes, is this important for PKR's escape from mimicry by K3L? So we go back to our yeast assay. Remember, human PKR is impervious to K3L, given PKR is not, so we wondered, what could we put in from human PKR into Gibbon to make given PKR impervious, right? Now we have a, you know, we don't have 800 amino acids of PKR. We are looking specifically at the alpha G helix and differences between human and Gibbon PKR at these residues. And what we find is individual amino acid mutations, either two of them or just a single mutation in a Gibbon backbone from this alanine to a serine, which is human-like, is able to give you three orders of magnitude better protection against human PKR, right? So there's no reason that this should have happened because there's no reason why, you know, averaging over 40 million years of evolution would give you this precise molecular readout. But I think this is reflecting the fact that all EIF2-alpha mimics have elicited the same molecular adaptation at the PKR level, which is why you're basically evolving within the box. This is sort of the world of adaptation, at least in terms of EIF to alpha mimicry escape. You'll also notice that orangutan, which is also impervious, its residues, SAK, actually do not provide as much of an advantage as the human residues, which means in the orangutan PKR, uh, this is not the reason why it is now immune to K3L. There has to be another reason. And that led us to map, uh, to, to do chimeric analysis Here's alpha G here, and we actually uncovered that a single residue at this uh, alpha E helix, and we don't know why this is structurally important, was important. So once again, Gibbon is not impervious. A single amino acid change makes it impervious. Orangutan, which is impervious, the reverse change makes it susceptible. So the important thing is that what this is reflecting is the selective coefficients associated with these individual amino acid changes are huge. You can have a single amino acid change, directed by a single nucleotide substitution that can change the host from a losing to a winning position. And these selective coefficients, if this happened in the context of a pathogen invading a population, are huge, which is why you can actually detect them even though you're averaging over 40 million years of mostly irrelevant evolution. Because when they occurred, they drove with them at such high frequency that they left that signature in the genome, yeah? That's right, so that, I'm gonna run out of time to talk about that, but I'll talk about that in the next lecture. What's interesting about this particular residue is we did not actually detect it under positive selection, but looking closer, you can see that one of the reasons we did not is because this only tolerates two types of residues, a leucine or a phenylalanine, right? So there's not enough permissivity in terms of amino acid changes for us to call this under positive selection, but it's basically toggling between these two states throughout evolution. Okay, so what is the rule that we basically, yes? So if whenever K3L loses out because of the difference in the PRK structures, you also expect the EIF2 in the wild type situation to lose out. Similarly, shouldn't it be? Yeah, so why doesn't it? So this is what this is, uh, this is about, right? So how is it that you're able to evolve escape against K3L exclusively while maintaining EIF2 alpha? 
So the rule, just with these uh, three or four PKR residues that we have said is that the rule is this cannot be because of just one residue or one domain. If it was just about one domain, they, you would opt in. It was checkmate as far as that. But the, the, the lesson that PKR tells us is it's basically come up with negative binding affinity where the PKR kinase domain actually reduces binding affinity to both EIF2 alpha and K3L and then restores binding affinity exclusively to EIF2 alpha because of evolution at a second domain. So it's a game of hot potato, cold potato. If it holds on very tightly to its substrate with one domain, it's a target of mimicry, it cannot escape. But if it reduces binding affinity just slightly enough and restores it with a second mutation, and we, we, it might be because it's recognizing this additional domain of EIF2 alpha, we don't know what it's actually recognizing, but it's able to reestablish exclusivity not by the primary binding interaction, but by a secondary binding interaction that restores it. And that's the game that's being played, which is why both of these surfaces show signatures of this genetic innovation, right? And so that might be one of those sort of underlying principles that perhaps pervades all of mimicry escape and detection. Uh, so this, this means that there's extraordinary flexibility for substrate re recognition that's been encoded in the kinase domain. Um, just as an example of that, I've already shown you this data. Here's the Gibbon backbone with the orangutan G helix. You'll notice, it not only is it not impervious to K3L, the growth arrest is now weakened also. It's not only, it's not even a good EIF2 alpha interactor. And yet the orangutan PKR is good at both, which means some other residue yet unmapped in the orangutan backbone restored both the EIF2 alpha binding as well as the K3L avoidance. And so there's probably even yet a third surface that's actually involved in restoring exclusivity to the EIF2 alpha binding. I just want to emphasize how unique this is because here are the four kinases and their G helix, all of these the same substrate, but only protein that is actually facing mimicry. And you can see this protein, this interaction residues, they're right, like they're rapidly evolving as you wouldn't believe, and yet they are basically frozen in these other EIF2 alpha kinases. So the indication is these guys have had the luxury to completely optimize for substrate recognition because there's no reason for you to not be optimized for substrate recognition. Whereas PKR, as it gets more and more optimal for EIF2 alpha binding, it becomes more and more susceptible to K3L mimicry. So it has chosen to live in a, a landscape of protein binding affinity, which is actually suboptimal for EIF2 alpha binding, because that's what allows it the ability to actually escape EIF2 alpha binding. I'm going to end my lecture with this uh, uh, last slide here. Um, this thing that I talked to you about K3L and EIF2 alpha might seem like an esoteric thing, but actually if you look at other processes that we really deeply care about, right, including people in this audience, cytoskeleton, cell cycle, apoptosis, membrane trafficking. I mean, the cytoskeleton is a really amazing example because pretty much every single thing we know about the cell biology of the cytoskeleton was actually revealed to us by a pathogen. So like Listeria has been the best cell biologist for the actin cytoskeleton because it hijacks all different components of that, which means all of this sort of machinery that we think about is so important for housekeeping function is actually simultaneously doing two things. It's doing housekeeping function, just like EIF2 alpha interaction, but it's also trying to escape pathogen hijacking, just like escape from K3L mimicry. This is a really important insight because there are high uh, frequency mutations in many genomes, including the human population, in several components of this. This would not make sense, like BRCA1, BRCA2, which are important for breast cancer susceptibility. These are important DNA repair machinery genes. Why would we expect there to be populations of humans that have such high frequency mutations that make them more susceptible uh, to cancers? Well, on their own, it doesn't make sense at all. But if you consider that these might be escape mutations that allowed the best compromise between escape from some unknown pathogen that hijacked a BRCA1, BRCA2, and yet allowed the housekeeping function to occur, they are the best compromise alleles that exist. In fact, our genome is probably chock full of these compromise alleles between this unknown impact of a pathogen and the impact that we know about, which are the housekeeping functions of these proteins. So with that sentiment, I'll just stop because I think I've already uh, gone over time a little bit. So we'll uh, pick this up again tomorrow. Thanks.
Any questions? I'm happy to, yeah. So my previous experience has uh, sh uh, showed that like whenever you have these uh, adaptive coevolutionary residues, there is a plasticity not just in the genotype but also in the in the mechanical properties. So do you see that these... Yeah, so that's what I was trying to crudely demonstrate with the kinase domain, is that we believe, uh, sorry, we believe that the impact of this mimicry has been to actually change the biophysics of the kinase recognition of PKR to make it distinct from all the other EIF2 alpha kinases. And we can see signatures of that just based on rates of binding or rates of evolution, right? So these guys are pretty much frozen in evolution. They have very low DNDS rates that are under purifying selection because they have not had any need to change their primary mode of binding to their substrate. Whereas PKR, because it cannot do that, it doesn't have a one winning strategy that allows it to discriminate. So it has had to basically alter its biophysics. There's a lot of very cool work that remains to be done on PKR. I would love for people in the audience, that's way beyond my pay grade to actually figure this out. But this is an unsolved, highly cool problem, which is what is the biophysics of the kinase domain? And it's very rare in evolution that you're provided with the ultimate control, the, the gene that PKR derived from, which has presumably completely different evolutionary coefficients compared to the gene that is now faced with mimicry. This slide. Okay. Hello. Yeah. So the secondary, uh, do we understand? This is by your lab, this paper? Yes. So I was just curious, do we understand in detail the mechanisms of how, how the no, secondary... We understand that these mutations restore binding, right. but uh, biophysically how we do that is, is unclear, right? I mean, that requires uh, some NMR type uh, analysis to look for like binding affinity and flexibility in general. But essentially, it is targeting, it is able to discriminate, it's very discriminatory That's between right. K3 so this and... Is, this is the data that goes to that uh, binding. So, so this is the alpha G helix of orangutan, grafted upon the given backbone, and it is not capable of resisting K3L, but it's also not very good as an EIF2 alpha kinase. However, the orangutan backbone is good at both. So something else in the orangutan genome has compensated for the fact that it has a really weak G helix, which is the primary mode of binding uh, to that. And so that's what's given it the exclusivity of EIF2 alpha interaction, but also the ability to basically protect against K3L mimicry. What this additional domain is, we don't know. It's not the alpha G or the alpha E helix. So that binding site is alpha E. This is not what the orangutan thing is. What I'm trying to infer is that it's not just two binding sites. We think there's a whole host of binding sites that can compensate exclusively for EIF2 alpha binding. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, you know, if one was to sort of uh, summarize, uh, so I want to... Uh, yeah, I'd love to see you, yeah. Uh, uh, if your mechanism is sufficiently complicated, then uh, the virus will not be able to mimic it. No, so is the that, virus is going to be able to find. So I'm going to show you in the next talk, human PKR, which is winning against uh, Vaccinia K3L. Vaccinia K3L is one mutation away from winning against human PKR. So it's not a permanently winning strategy, but it now provides you the la adaptive landscape you need to escape. It's not like this is a winning strategy that's winning for all time, but it allows you now for the red queen to take place. Otherwise, mimicry is a checkmate type scenario, right? And the fact that you've got this adaptive landscape just gives you more escape routes. I see. So you increase your complexity, and that's basically giving you an escape route. You until, increase until, your complexity, and you compromise your chief housekeeping function. Right. And then, basically, that gives you some leeway. Uh, uh, you know, some time to buy, and you bought some time before the bacteria, Basically. before the virus can also uh, mimic that complex. Yeah, so if the virus mimics that new complex, you still have escape routes to go back to an another winning solution. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, Eric? How much could the virus and the host do by just trying to upregulate the expression of either of these proteins? This is exactly the topic for the next lecture. I don't know if you're going to come, but uh, that's, there's a lot to be learned from the upregulation, right? So PKR is a kind of a dangerous gene to upregulate. Mm -hmm. 
because I told you that double stranded RNA is very rare in the host cytoplasm, but it does exist. If you think about ribosomal RNA, there's lots of double stranded stretches in it, not all of them are protected. If you massively overexpress PKR, you will kill the cell on its own, independent of the virus, right? So PKR expression is fairly tightly regulated on its own. There's no reason for K3L expression to be tightly regulated, right? Except if you express it at high enough levels and it begins to interfere with the translation machinery, which is why we think it's actually jettisoned everything it needs to interact with the translation machinery so that it can be expressed at very high levels. And in the next lecture, I'll show you one of the primary modes of its adaptation is to be expressed at very high levels. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So I don't know if this equation makes sense, but it seems to me that um, PQR evolved some mechanisms, right? Um, which allow for, for the escape, right? Now, it seems like there should have been some pressure to evolve these mechanisms, right? It shouldn't be the case that it has all of these escape routes if it wasn't pressure to, to make for them, and now it's only using one surface of them. So what's, what's your... Yeah, I, think, I think it's not, it's not at all a weird question. In fact, it, I, I thank you for pointing this out. This is a very hard thing for PKR to do, right? Because it's, essentially it's compromised on its core function, which is the EF to alpha interaction. And the fact that it has done so multiple times during evolution is an indication that multiple times in evolution it has faced EIF to alpha mimicry as a challenge. And that's one of the things that I was trying to indicate that we know of at least three current day viruses that have converged on EIF to alpha mimicry as a, as a strategy. Presumably this has happened over and over in, in evolution. And what we are seeing is a cumulative signature of this particular type of uh, antagonism, which is uh, EIF to alpha mimicry, which is very distinct from other modes of binding uh, antagonism, which we'll also talk about. But this is a particular mode which is particularly hard to escape, which is why we've basically engineered these strategies uh, inbuilt into the PKR system. Yeah. Yeah, so we would infer that it's basically faced this throughout its evolution. Yeah. Okay, I just want to remind you there is lunch, and I'm sure many of you are hungry as a